right, well, welcome, everybody. We're in the tail end of the book of Ezekiel. This week and next week, next week, we'll put the book of Ezekiel to bed. Tonight, we're actually going to cover two chapters. We won't read them in their entirety, but we will read big sections of it. The portions that we won't read are things that may not keep you awake out there and give me a fighting chance. So let's jump in here tonight. If you notice, I give the title of chapters 45 and 46, The Sacrifices. It's a little play on it. You'll see what I'm going with here because there's something about the sacrifices that are different in our future. So let's talk about the millennial age or the Sabbath. So looking at the big picture, those that are pure dispensationalists, and and that name gets a bad term in a lot of different colleges and universities and seminaries even today, dispensationalists just believe this, that there was different ages of time. There was an age of innocence, Adam and Eve in the garden before sin. Then there was an age of conscience. They now know the difference between right and wrong after they eaten of the forbidden tree, right? And then there was an age of the law. Then there's an age of the church. There will be a tribulation age and a new millennial age, the thousand year reign of Christ, and then eternity. They're the ages that the Bible spells out. That's what dispensationals that don't take it too far understand, that you're just really talking about a time period of what was happening in humanity, okay? So this is very interesting because if you look at this, remember God created in how many days? Six days, right? And then he did what? He rested on the seventh. He called it the Sabbath, right? So many dispensationalists say, could our lives actually mirror creation? If a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, are we 6,000 years right now coming up to the 6,000 years or some believe in the 6,000 years already of man's history? Now, I know if you are a old world creation person that you believe that it took billions and millions and billions of years, you probably are having a problem with the Bible aspect that we could only maybe be five to 6,000 years in recorded man history, which we know we really don't even have 5,000, we have 5,000 plus in some historical records that we have. And, and so looking at that, if we're at the 6,000 year and a year is like a day, is the millennial reign the seventh day or the Sabbath, okay? So that's, it's kind of like a, a big picture of what could God be doing for a thousand years with us. Is it a thousand year Sabbath? And many eschatologists, they believe that it has that kind of hint to it. So this is in your study notes right at the beginning. The millennial age or the Sabbath is the age of the Sabbath, is what some call it. Everything that is a single Sabbath is for humanity, a whole age for a thousand years for Christ. Hmm. Because he'll be reigning here from earth. It will no longer be the devil, the prince of the air. He'll be locked up and everything. So it's a Sabbath from the devil. A millennial Sabbath from the devil's reigning. He has never been locked up. Lucifer has, but he will be for this thousand year. And so that's kind of the thinking behind it. So number three, the seventh day. Was it the wedding day between Adam and Eve? Did Adam have a day surgery where God took out the the rib and made Eve and, and supernaturally healed him. And all of a sudden he says, whoa, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. And for this reason, a man's going to leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, and the two become one. So if Adam and Eve were married on the seventh day because she was created at the end of the sixth day, if their wedding is the seventh day, that's a very short engagement period, isn't it? And Could the millennial age have these two aspects? That it's a thousand year reign, a Sabbath from the arrest, from having to do battle with the arch enemy of God, Lucifer, because he's locked up. And could it also be a thousand year wedding party 
with the bridegroom. But in his second coming, he comes back with his bride and he sets up his kingdom reign here, uh, especially for the Jews. So these are some of the different thinking out there. Many don't talk about these things. I'll tell you why they don't speak much on it, because all of a sudden it seems like you could be going allegory in this realm and really no it's more of a big picture view not an allegory eschatologists really hate the the term allegory because they feel like that's what the progressive movement has done has tried to make everything in genesis and a lot in the bible an allegory and we really believe that the bible tells you when it's giving something as an allegory or a parable or as a poem that he he openly says it will be like this or this parable or this is a song and and so the bible kind of spells out the areas that are allegory is what the brian teachings would be of studying the bible all right so underneath that i put some things for your notes here that shabbat if you want to say it in the jewish form or the sabbath is a rest from work and it actually means rest with special clothing for the wedding that is done that they dress up for the wedding and the bible talks about his bride having a special dress special robes and all the rest so is this part of the thousand year millennial reign time will tell and with the special indulgences with special delights and pleasurable activities for this thousand years. It's not a thousand years of just work, but humanity goes on because there's marrying, birthing of children, and there is still even death, and there's still sin, but no devil, no demonic force. It's only up to the will of humanity of whether they obey God or not, all right? So that's kind of the background. You need to kind of know some of those things as we go into here now to chapter 45. We're going to take a large segment of this here and read. And if remember, I called it the sacrifice. Watch what God actually says to Ezekiel about this whole time period and the key word that he likes to use over and over again. We start in verse 1 of chapter 45. When you allot the land as in the inheritance, you are to present to the Lord a portion of the land as a sacred district. I love this in some of the things they call it a sacred holy district. 25,000 cubits long, 20,000 cubits wide. This is roughly uh, a square that eight point some miles one direction and you know, less than eight the other, but uh, this perfect square is what, is what they tell us in this, all right? Uh, the entire area will be holy. Now you know why they call it the holy district. I like that, don't you? Can you imagine that in our world, there will be a section of land that many miles wide and that many miles long that the whole area will be set apart as holy here on earth when humanity is still living and going on of this a section of 500 cubit squares is to be for the sanctuary with 50 cubits around it for open land it's the sacred district measured off at a section of 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 cubits wide it will be the sanctuary the most holy place it will be the sacred portion of the land for the priests who minister in the sanctuary and who draw near to minister before the Lord. So when you hear that, because you listened last week to chapters 43 and 44, the ministers, the priests that, are, that draw near to the Lord are the priests in the line of Zadok, Z-A-D-O-K. The Levitical priests, they are servants at the gates and to the people, but not unto the Lord because of their bad boy times before for the thousand years it says they deal with their iniquity of that they didn't do right by god when they were priests in that so now they're servants not unto the lord but unto the people and to in the areas of entrances around this holy district all right so that's just tying last week and this week's together as as we take notes within that let's pick it up in verse five an area 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 cubits wide will belong to the Levites who serve in the temple as their possession for the towns to live in. 
you are to give the city as the property an area 5,000 cubits wide and 25,000 cubits long, adjoining the sacred portion, it will belong to all Israel. The prince, now if you don't know who that is, we'll discover it in just a minute. The prince will have the land bordering each side of the area formed by this sacred district and the property of the city. It will extend westward from the west side and eastward from the east side, running lengthwise from the western to the eastern border, parallel to one of the tribal portions. This land will be possession in Israel. And my princes will no longer oppress my people, but will allow the people of Israel to possess the land according to their tribes. This is setting up where the book's going to end with the tribes in the possession of their lands, okay? It sets it up this far in advance. In what the sovereign Lord says, you have gone far enough, prince of Israel. Give up your violence and oppression and do what is just and right. Stop disposing my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are to use accurate scales, an accurate ephah, and an accurate bath. The Ephah and the bath are to be the same size. The bath containing a tenth of a homer and the ephah a tenth of a homer. And the homer is to be the standard measured for both. The shekel is to be consistent of 20 geras, 20 shekels plus 25 shekels plus 15 shekels equals one mina. This is all the measurements. Now, why all this detail? Because God is a God of detail, and the future will have these details for things that they will follow out in that thousand years. This is the special gift you are to offer, a sixth of an ephah from each homer of wheat and a sixth of an ephah from each homer of barley. The prescribed portion of olive oil measured by the bath is a tenth of a bath from each core, which consists of 10 baths or one homer, for the ten baths are equivalent to a homer. As one sheep is to be taken from every flock of 200 from the well-watered pastures of Israel. Let me just tell you what's going on here. This is the giving process back to the priest and all the rest. Just like how we have a tithe here. This is not taxation. This is how they give back to the priesthood that it's talking about in all this right here. That won't be in your notes. I just threw it in as as a footnote for you. Let's pick it up in verse 16. All the people of the land will require to give this special offering to the prince in Israel. All right. These first 16 verses here give us a new pattern. Verses 1 through 7 is what we described as the holy or sacred district for the Lord is set apart for who? For yes, the Levitical priests have their households within this. The Zadok priesthoods have it. And this prince and Jesus himself lives in the holy district during this time, okay? And so, verse 8 tells us that the land it will be divided for the tribes. That's the 12 tribes of Israel. Verses 9 through 16 says Jerusalem is for all people. That's important because it's not just for the Jews. Jerusalem is for, if you remember last week, chapters 43 and 44, Jerusalem actually means God's city, the city of God. And that after the great white throne judgment, when God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, he's going to create a new Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is not a Jewish thing, it's a God thing. If you didn't catch it, and this is the only one you're going to catch here online, the temple is not a Jewish thing. There's a temple that's always been in heaven, and that's what God gave to Solomon, who built the temple, the directions and all the things to do a replica of what was in heaven. So we're starting to see that there's been glimpses of heaven on earth all throughout history, and we probably didn't realize it. Isn't that amazing? So Jerusalem is for all the people. There's a special offering for the prince of Israel. I have put David as a question mark there. I believe, personally, I believe the prince is David. The king is Jesus. But there will be those that will come back and reign with Jesus. And remember, Ezekiel tipped the hand in, in one chapter several times, and it says, and David will be there. David, I believe, is the prince that it's talking about in this. 
and how they are to interact. He's supposed to interact with the people and especially with the priest at this time. Okay, so because remember the priests are more in, the Zadok priests are more in the order of Melchizedek, like Jesus is in that order, that there was this king and yet they were priest servants. And Jesus is the high priest and yet he is the king. And so there, it's more that we're more like Jesus in this setup for the millennial reign. All right, now this next section is going to deal with, there's changes. This is one of the reasons why Ezekiel almost didn't make it into the Bible, into the Jewish Bible, because there's so much changes compared to what happens today in the Levitical part of feast and festivals. That's, that word is interchangeable. If I say it's a feast, it can be a festival. Those words are interchangeable. And because of such a difference in the future, one of the, uh, several of the rabbis actually had to get together and say, this is speaking about a future when our Messiah is here, that he will deal with the feast in a different way than what we're being given here in the Old Testament. They were at peace with that, and they let Ezekiel get into the Bible, which the Protestant world, the Christian world, accepted Ezekiel all the way all along because they saw this portion as a prophecy also. So in this next portion here, we started in verse 17. It will be the duty of the prince to provide the burnt offering, grain offering, drink offering at the festivals, the new moons and the Sabbaths. At all the appointed festivals of Israel, he will provide the sin offerings, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and fellowship offerings to make atonement for the Israelites. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. In the first month of the first day, you are to take a young bull without defect and purify the sanctuary. This is the purity act of the first day of the first month of the year here. The priest is to take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorposts of the temple, on the four corners and the upper ledges of the altar, and on the gateposts of the inner court. Blood on the doorpost, is this kind of reminding you of something here? Remember that happened? There's a connection here, so just wanted to point that out. You are to do the same on the seventh day of the month for anyone who sins, watch this phrase, anyone who sins unintentionally or through ignorance, so you are to make atonement for the temple. In the first month of the 14th day, you are to observe Passover. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, you should. This is a key. We're going to talk about this. This is a big change of the calendar in the millennial reign. Okay? In the first month on the 14th day, you are to observe the Passover, a festival lasting seven days during which you shall eat bread made without yeast. On that day, the prince is to provide a bull as a sin offering for himself. This is why you know that the prince isn't Jesus. Some commentaries try to go that, oh, that prince is Jesus. Jesus wouldn't need a sin offering for himself. He's sinless, okay? So that's why it tells you that if the prince isn't David, then the prince is an office that will be held in Jerusalem. Many of the scholars believe it's David or it's this office that's held as the prince. I don't know why it wouldn't be David since Jesus is reigning the world David's going to reign Jerusalem or be in charge of Jerusalem of this area, especially this district here. So it's a sacrifice, sin offering for himself for all the people of the Lamb. Every day during the seven days of the festival, he's to provide seven bulls, seven rams without defects as a burnt offering to the Lord and a male goat for a sin offering. He's to provide as a grain offering an ephah for each bull and an ephah for each ram, along with a hen of olive oil for each ephah. During the seven days of the festival, which begins, now watch this, on the seventh month, on the 15th day, he's to make the same provisions for the sin offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, and oil. All right, so what's going on here? Verses 17 through 25. When you read the Bible, I know when you're reading it, you're reading it for what it says. When you've read it for a long time, you sometimes need to read it for what it doesn't say. Remember, God set up seven feasts or festivals. 
Passover, unleavened, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles. Look at point number one here under this. 17 to 25, no mention of the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Pentecost in the millennial. In the millennium reign, in that millennial time, these feasts are not mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. There's a lot of speculation of why. I'll tell you why I think in just a few moments. Verse 21 and 25 give two feast time periods. The first, it says, will be the first month of the year, and it says the feast will be Passover. And then in the seventh month, it's going to be tabernacles. Both are seven-day-long feasts. Okay? So we do know there's going to be two time periods, twice a year, the first of the month of the year, and the seventh month of the year, there'll be a festival for a week. Okay, twice a year. And the one will cover Passover, where Jesus came as the Passover lamb. Many scholars, because of what Zechariah, because of what Jeremiah writes, because of what Isaiah writes, and because especially of this section, many of them believe that his second coming will be during the Feast of Tabernacles. Because of the, all the different things hidden in the Feast of Tabernacles about that the Jews do this to this day. They've been doing it for 4,000 plus years that they build these booths with openings and they, they lay in the ground, they teach their kids, they lay on the ground, they look up through the top of the booth and they pray this prayer. They pray to the bridegroom of creation to come quickly. Hmm. So did God tuck into the Feast of the Tabernacles the truth that the bridegroom is going to come on the, during the Feast of the Tabernacles? Remember, no man knows the day or the hour of the rapture, but his second coming, the day that abomination of desolation is put in there, you can count a three and a half year period and Daniel actually gives you the actual days, 1260 days. You can count from that day to that that Jesus is coming back in that time period. On that 1260 day, He's coming. So it's so that they can hold out because they're, they're going through a time period that no other people have ever seen. He puts that there so they have this hope of, I only have to make it another day. Oh, we're down to only this many days left. And they look for His coming, that He will land on the Mount of Olives. And it's been tucked away in this. So when you're thinking of the second coming, don't think rapture where no one knows the day or the hour. The second coming, we know the time period. It's the end of the seven years, especially the end of that last three and a half years. It gives you the exact day and time. All right. Here's something else when you read the Bible. In this, both the Passover and Tabernacles, there is no sacrifice of a lamb. There's sacrifice of, of bulls, of goats, of rams, but no lamb. All right, let me tell you why I think the sacrifices are missing and no sacrifice of the lamb. Lambs will be in offerings weekly. You're going to see that here in the short little things that we'll read in this next chapter. Lambs will be offered weekly, but they're not in the Passover or the tabernacle because it's complete and fulfilled. If you remember, we take communion, we look back at Calvary and we take communion in remembrance. This is a generation that God is fulfilling the, the covenant to Abraham that his descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Babies that are being born in Jerusalem, especially in that area of Israel, he wants them to know their history, and he's teaching them how now all the... If you notice, the word sacrifice wasn't used in chapter 45. They were all offerings. They were all offerings he will use the word sacrifice at the very end of chapter 46 as we read it you'll see why he uses it there but what he's saying is in the millennial reign all the offerings are going to point back to what he fulfilled they don't need to do sacrifices because the sacrifice is complete they will call these offerings will bulls die and rams die and goats die absolutely it's going to be what many of the scholars believe. That's going to be the food of the priests and the Levites. This is what they're going to eat and all the things. But it's as an offering 
to the Lord. Okay, so it's kind of a, a weird thing where you go, wow, for that thousand years. It's not till we get past the great white throne judgment that there's no more death. It's after the great white throne judgment and the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and it says there will be no more death. No animals die, no anything dies in the new eternity. But this is the thousand year reign, so don't confuse the two. All right, now... What you saw when it said the first month of the year on the 14th day, this will be the seven days of Passover. This is point number four here. The civil and the religious calendars show the dominance of the spiritual calendar. The calendar is going to change. So right now, as you switch your page over, this is the millennial calendar on your left is the current calendar from 1 through 12. The key is there in the what is now the seventh month. The Jew and the Hebrew has always spoken in this way, that they have a year within the year. Right now, on the left, in their first 12 months, their religious month starts in the seventh month with Passover. Passover is the first event. The blood on the doorposts, kind of what you're seeing again as a remembrance here, as in the offerings here, the blood on the doorposts. It now starts in their seventh month of the year, right now, currently. That's what all the Jews celebrate. It's their seventh month. They start Passover. They end it on the first month of the next year. Is a seven-month religious calendar within a year but it's not really within a year it starts on the seventh and it ends on the first month of the next year so what god does that's their civil calendar on that side that's the way their government's set up he's going to show you that just as lucifer's locked up for a thousand years and there's their sabbath and there's this wedding and there's all these things that are going on that he changes the calendar that now the first month in the millennial is the month that starts with Passover. They're going to realign the calendar instead of what their present current is. The first month is what he just told us in this. On the first month, on the 14th day, Passover. On the seventh month, in the new calendar, is Tishra, which is the month we're in right now, will be Tabernacles. That's the month Tabernacles is always in. And so... That's important to know that this is a millennial calendar that gets switched because it's showing the dominance of the spiritual over the civil. We live now where the civil controls the spiritual in our world. The governments and all the rest, the spiritual is going to control the governments. It's going to control because Jesus is reigning. It's his kingdom for a thousand years. And so this is the key switch here that takes place just something to know within that we're only going to look at a few verses here in chapter 46 because it ties in with with this switch and the changes of what takes place here but i i think it's really important to know let's look at the first 10 verses here this is what the sovereign lord says the gate in the inner court facing east is to be shut on six working days but on the sabbath day and on the day of the new moon it is to be open the prince is to enter from the outside through the portico, and that word just means porch. It's, it's like a porch opening, portico, of the gateway and stand by the gatepost. The priests are to sacrifice his burnt offerings and his fellowship offerings. He's to bow down in worship at the threshold of the gateway and then go out. But the gate will not be shut until evening. On the Sabbaths and the new moons, the people of the land are to worship in the presence of the Lord at the entrance of the gateway. Just a little footnote in this. I don't know if you can catch this, but each week. Now, Seventh-day Adventists love this because the Sabbath is what's in the play in the millennial, not Sunday. Okay, so all of a sudden they go, we had it right all this time. You go, we should never have put down the Sabbath part of it. You don't want to become legalistic because the Sabbath is not Lord over us. We're Lord over the Sabbath. And we create it Sunday because it's Resurrection Day as the day that we worship. It shouldn't be a big issue in the here and now. But in the millennial, God settles that issue. 
And guess who's going to church with us every, every Sunday on the Sabbath? That's what it just said here, that we're worshiping in the presence of the Lord every Sabbath during this thousand year reign. I love that. The burnt offerings the priest bring to the Lord on the Sabbath day is to be six male lambs and a ram all without defects. See, so the lambs do show up weekly. The grain offerings given with the ram is to be an ephah. And the grain offering with the lamb is to be as much as he pleases along with a hen of olive oil for each ephah. On the day of the new moon, he is to offer a young bull, six lambs and a ram, all without defects. He is to provide as a grain offering one ephah with the bull, one ephah with the ram, and with the lambs as much as he wants to give along with a hint of oil for each ephah. When the prince enters, he is to go in through the portico or the porch of the gateway, and he's to come out the same way. When the people of the land come before the Lord at the appointed festivals, whoever enters by the north gate, this is really a strange thing, and nobody knows why, enter by the north gate, worship is to go out the south gate, and whoever enters by the south gate is to go out through the north gate. No one is to return through the gate by which they entered, but each is to go out the opposite gate. The prince is to be among them, going in when they go in and going out when they go out. What's that all about? All right. Again, God has given us details of the future to prove that he'll dot every I, cross every T of these prophecies about Abraham's covenant, David's covenant, and this millennial reign. We see that it is the Sabbath. Here's it under the Sabbath the new moon. The temple is only open. Though the priests are, are there, they're taking care of the people, there are priests that are there ministering to the Lord, but the temple is open for public only on the Sabbath and new moons. Now there's a new moon every month. So it's open once a month for the new moon, and it's open up every Saturday or, or Sabbath day during the, the month. So basically five times during the month, the temple will be open, and it's a time of worship. And then a time of remembrance. The prince's job, this is the prince, he teaches a new generation about the day of rest and remembrance. And this is the biblical aspect that so many get excited about because so much has crept into our day of rest and our day of remembrance. I remember as a kid when I was growing up, even stores didn't want to be open on Sunday because it was our day of rest and our day of remembrance. I believe we're going to go back to these things of where that day is a special day each week. The prince, again, David, I put the question mark because we can't say definitively, but many lean that way, is to be accessible to the people during the feasts and the festivals. What it's saying is how different it is than what they had in the past, where the king could be seen but couldn't be touched by just everybody. And it's saying he is going to be there while the people are there coming and going, and he'll be out there among the people. So there's this accessibility of this prince during this whole time. And that the word offering seems to replace sacrifice, except for in these last three verses that we're going to give 16 through 19. All right. Let's look at the end of this chapter here. The rest of the details I'm leaving out are the details again about offerings and things that I think that if I just read it to you, I knew at this point, we're six minutes away from closing, that you would kind of go, I'm passing out if he tells us how all these offerings are going to be done in this. So, but the end is important to catch this here. So let's pick it up in verse 16. This is what the sovereign Lord says. If the prince makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his sons, it will also belong to his descendants. It is to be their property by inheritance. If, however, he makes a gift from his inheritance to one of his servants, the servant may keep it until the year of freedom. Some translations, the year of jubilee. All right, And then it will revert to the prince. His inheritance belongs to his sons only. It is theirs. 
the prince must not take any of the inheritance from the people or the tribes that they're going to. That's it's setting up chapter 47 and 48, the closing of this. The prince must not take any inheritance of the people, driving them off their property. He is to give his sons their inheritance out of his own property so that no one of my people will be separated from their property. Then the man brought me through the entrance of the side of the gate to the sacred rooms facing north, which belonged to the priest, and showed me a place at the west end. All right, now... Look, so while you got your Bibles open, look at the very last verse of this, verse 24. It won't be up on the screen. He said to them, these are the kitchens where those who minister at the temple are to cook the sacrifices of the people. All right. Now, it uses the word there that it lets you know that all these offerings, animals are dying, and they're to be cooked for all the people. These are the meals also. Okay, so this is different than anything in the Levitical part. All these meals, the lambs, it, it, it says and enough lamb till they had enough that they didn't want to eat any more lamb. So that's a weekly part of the Sabbath and all the other festivals when it gave those things out. So it uses the word sacrifice to just let you know these animals are an offering, but it's not to actually do to remove anything. It's as what we take communion. We don't take communion to be saved. We take communion because we are saved as a remembrance. They're going to do all these offerings as a remembrance of what God did through all of history, pointing to his son and the fulfillment of his son. So I wanted to put that in there for you. And so here at the end here, let me give you the property. It sets up our closing next week that we'll finish. A land gift to a son is permanent. A land gift to a servant is for 50 years or a jubilee. No land is allowed to be confiscated, and the priest's housing is provided for them, I should have them in there, within the holy district. Provided for them in a holy district. They get to live in that. So it's not just the holy of holies is holy. This whole district is the holy place of God where the priests live, where the prince lives, where the people get to come for for worship on the Sabbath, where they come for their festivals. This is where it's at. And again, this is focusing on Israel. Why? What happened at the very end when the image of the Antichrist goes, of the beast, goes into the temple, the scales for the first time fall off all of Israel's eyes and they recognize Jesus as the Messiah. So, what is actually taking place, why is this just for them? What's happening in the Gentile world? If you were here when we went through Zechariah, it spells out some of those different things. We're still going through our part, but we are worshiping on the Sabbath at that time too. Are we doing sacrifices? No. This is just for Israel. This is their wedding party for a thousand years, having babies, celebrating, and going through everything for a thousand years with Jesus before we go into judgment, the great white throne judgment. So that's kind of what this is all about. That's why so many of you say, really the millennial reign is for, yes, Gentiles will be here. The other nations are spoken about that they have to come up. Um, if you were in, when we did Zechariah, they come up during the Feast of Tabernacles. All the world comes to pay respect to the Lord on the Feast of Tabernacles. Why that feast? Passover is when he gave his life. So why the Feast of Tabernacles would they have to come up? Again, scholars believe it points to it has to be because that's when the wedding took place of Israel with the Lord and his second coming and that. So Tabernacles is why that gets that kind of part of it.